In the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would like to talk about how we can interpret machine learning models and why I think it is important to interpret machine learning models. So more and more big data and, data and machine learning is becoming part of the core business of many organizations, both in the public and private sectors. And this is due, as you may always know, due to the growth in the availability of data that allows these organizations to make better data-driven decisions. In fact, in finance, there are many areas, sorry, in insurance, there are many areas where we can use machine learning to improve the decisions that we make and allow some, uh, some type of automation, like for example, claims handling and fraud prevention, and also digital and marketing, as well as pricing, just to name a few. And there are also as well many machine learning algorithms that we can use to try to introduce this automation or better decisions, like for example, linear models like logistic and linear regression, and also tree-based models like random forest and gradient-boosted trees, as well as neural networks. And we can apply neural networks to tabular data, to images, and also to text. So, <clears throat> but many, many of these machine learning models have been traditionally regarded as black box algorithms because it is very difficult, or this is what we believe, to understand how the algorithm reaches the decision what, once it outputs a decision. And in particular, this is true for, well, so black uh, gradient boosted trees and neural networks are regarded as, as, as black box algorithms. So is this really the case? So let's imagine, for example, that we want to predict whether a claim is legitimate or is a fraudulent claim. So we feed the information of the claim through the machine learning algorithms that is, in essence, a black box. And this algorithm would make a decision, and we are unclear as to why, why this algorithm made this decision. In this case, it assigned a high probability of a claim to be fraudulent. So we want to interpret this decision, and, and why do we want to interpret this decision? For two reasons. First of all, we want to be able to tell our customers why we reached a decision, and this is particularly true and particularly important in the light of the new regulation for data protection. But also, we want to help our investigators understand why an algorithm made a decision, why the algorithm thinks that this claim is fraudulent, because this will allow our investigators to look, to have a hint at what to look out for in this claim to determine if it's fraudulent or not. So what we want to do is we want to open this black box and understand which variables the algorithm is looking at to make the decision that it makes. So how can we interpret then machine learning models? Can we interpret them at all? Concomitantly with the increase in the interest to understand the decisions that the algorithms make, there is also an increase in the tools available for us to interpret these machine learning models. I'm going to talk about a little bit about how to interpret different models. So say, for example, this linear model that we have here. So the x's, x1 to x2 to xn, are the input variables that we feed into the model. And the vitas, in this case, are the coefficients that the algorithm has selected to time those variables to make the prediction y. So it is quite clear to see that the bigger the, v, the vita, the highest the value in the vita, the highest the contribution of that variable to make that particular prediction. And in fact, for a single claim in this case, the, the contribution of each variable is given by the coefficient times the real value, the actual value of that variable for that particular customer. So if for customer one, we time beta one times x one, we get the exact contribution of that variable to that prediction. And the same is true for logistic regression. Logistic regression is, in essence, is a transformation of this variable, but the same applies, so the same principle applies. So this is why linear models have been traditionally preferred in business scenarios like insurance and finance, because they are very easy to interpret, straightforward. And I wanted to sh uh, show an example of how we can use this algorithm. Of course, I cannot show company data, so I chose the very famous Titanic data set from Kaggle. And on the left, you can see one passenger in particular. What we're trying to do is we're trying to predict if the passenger is going to survive. In this case, it didn't, based on a bunch of uh, characteristics of the passenger. 
And this data set is very well known. So we know, for example, that the fact that the passengers were female and children allowed them well, increase the probability of survival based on the women and children first back of the day. And also, if the customer was wealthy, they were more likely to survive. And we can infer wealth by looking at the fare. So the higher the ticket, the richer the customer, and also P class. So the higher the class that the customer was traveling in, the more likely they were to survive because the richer they were in essence. So for this particular customer, if we time the input variables for the coefficients that were fitted in the logistic regression, we can then produce a plot like the one that I show on the right, where I indicate in red the, the variables that contributed for this particular customer, for this particular passenger, to decrease the probability of survival. And we can see that in this case, the fact that a customer was a mister indicated by tactile and was traveling in, first, in third class decreased his probability of survival. And in blue, I indicate the variables that were not so important in decreasing the probability of survival. In fact, it increases a little bit. Like for example, the fact that it embarked in the port sea. This is not a very important variable to make a prediction. So this is how we used logistic regression and how we can interpret on a claim by claim level, passenger by passenger level, customer by customer level. Can we interpret the decision of trees as well? Well, in fact, we can. So trees, as you may know, are a series of yes, no answers that continue to divide the data into different buckets until it reaches a conclusion. So how can we determine on a passenger level how the, how the variables contributed to the decision of the algorithm? If we look, for example, at, pass at this passenger, we can determine the baseline probability by basically determining how likely, how many passengers survive on the Titanic itself. So this is the baseline. From all the passengers, 38% survived. So this is the ba baseline probability. And we ask the first passenger if, there, if they were male. And the answer for this particular passenger is not. It was a female. That increased the probability already from 0.38 to 0.82, so on 0.44, as we can see on the equation on the right. So therefore, the fact that this passenger was female increased her probability of survival by 0.44. So there, straight away, we can get the contribution of this variable for that particular customer for this particular algorithm. If we look at this other passenger, for example, we ask them again if they were male. The answer in this case is not. So that decreased his probability of survival from 0.38 to 0.18. So it decreased the probability by 0.2, as we can see on the second equation. And then we ask him another question, which is, did you have, sorry, is, are you older than nine? The answer is not in this case. So because it was a child that increased his probability of survival by 0.42, as we can see also on the equation, taking it from 0.18 to 0.60. So now we know that the, the age of this customer contributed an increase in probability on 0.42. And we ask a third question, is whether they have more than two members of the family in the Titanic? The answer is, is, is yes in this case. So again, this decreased the probability of survival by 0.30. So we see how navigating through the path of the tree, we can determine feature by feature the contribution of that variable for that particular customer in that particular algorithm that we just built. That is a decision tree. Random forests are a collection, if you want, of decision trees where the conclusions of each tree are averaged to make the final decision. So if we average the contribution of the features of each tree, we can get the final contribution of each feature to the final random forest decision. So this algorithm is not a black box anymore. And for gradient boosted trees, the way we build the trees is, one, is, is, is additive. So one tree builds on the previous tree by correcting the prediction, if you want. So then if we add the contributions of the features across all the trees, again, we are able to reconstruct the contribution of each individual feature to the decision of the gradient boosted tree for that particular customer. So again, this model is not a black box anymore. And then, once we do this, we can provide our investigators with a plot like the one I show on the right, where I indicate in red the variables that improved, the, sorry, that decreased the prediction of survival of this customer. And we can see again that text and gender are the main ones. And in blue, the ones that were not so important, like for example, embarked in this case. 
So what about neural networks? Can we determine, can we interpret how neural networks reach a decision as well? So in this simple neural network, I'm illustrating in green the variables that we feed into the network. And in blue, I illustrate the first layer of neurons that are going to make the first interpretation of these inputs. And then in red, I have the final output neuron that is going to reinterpret the first interpretation of the neural network of the first layer. So this is a very simple architecture. I just put it here for an, ex for a, for an easy explanation of how this works. And each of the neurons, each of the blues and also the red, what they are basically fitting is a linear model. They are fitting an equation of the type that I show on the top, where we time, so each neuron times the input variables by the coefficients to determine a prediction, to make a prediction. This linear model is then squeezed via an activation function, but let's forget about the activation function for a while. So what we see is that each neuron will make an assessment on whether a feature is important or not by assigning it a big beta or a small beta. So if we then look at the entire blue layer, if we average the coefficients, we can get an overview of what the first layer thinks of, the first, of how each variable contributed to the prediction. The second layer does exactly the same. So it will assign a coefficient, but this time it will assign a coefficient to the output of the first layer. So it will look at neuron one, and if it thinks that it's doing an amazing job, it's going to assign it a high coefficient. If it thinks that it's doing a terrible job, it will assign it a small coefficient. So then by looking at the coefficients that were, in, that were assigned in the second layer, in the output neuron, we can determine how important the neurons from the first layer were at determining the output of this decision for this particular customer. So in essence, what we do here is to propagate back the multiplication of the coefficients, first the coefficients times the neurons, and then the neurons already squeezed by the multiplication of the coefficients of the red neuron times the coefficient, and we average across the first network. And that can give us a view of what this network thinks about the particular passenger that I'm going to show here. So if we do this, we can show again our investigators, a plot like I show on the right, where we see in red the variables that decreased the probability of survival and the variables that increased in blue the probability of survival. And if we look in particular at the variables, we can see that the neural network pick age and title that decreased the probability of survival, so that is good, the method works, the network also works, but it also picked embarked as indicating that this probability of survival uh, the, the indicating, so it thinks, this network thinks that Embark is contributing to the decrease in the probability. And this, in fact, is not true, right? In the Titanic, Embark doesn't really matter to predict the probability or not. But something that I didn't tell you is that this network's performance was much worse than the gradient boost to trees and the logistic regression. Therefore, these interpretations allows me to identify why this network is not behaving as expected. So it's looking at Embarked and it's thinking that Embarked is important when in fact it isn't. So by looking individual cases like this one, I am able to understand why the network is not working as I would like it to work. Why this is the case? Well, potentially because this network was overly complicated, so the one that I'm showing here, so these results belong to a two-layer architecture with several neurons, and it's potentially an overkill for a small data set like the Titanic. So in a nutshell, what I want to say is that it is possible to interpret machine learning models. It is possible to interpret these black mode algorithms. Uh, we can, in the case of the traditional methods, time the coefficients by the inputs or follow the tree path. And in the case of networks, we can make a retropropagation of the coefficients. And for the fact of, of for the classic algorithms, we can find packages nowadays to reconstruct the, and interpret the, 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 the machine learning decision. There are packages available for Python and there are packages available for R. The same is not true for neural networks, unfortunately. So this is something that we developed in-house. Uh, for the classic machine learning algorithms, the interpretation is simple and straightforward, actually. It's just a couple of lines of code. For the other one, it gets a little bit more complicated when we start increasing the complexity of the network, and particularly if we start using convolutional or recursive neural networks. So maybe for situations like this, solution like Lime is more 
applicable if you want. So how do we use this in insurance? We build the machine learning model, the best predictive one. We collect the data of the claim. We pass it through the machine learning model. The model predicts a probability, in this case of fraudulent, so this, it seems that this claim is illegitimate. And then we interpret the decision on a claim-by-claim -claim basis, so we are able to produce outputs like the uh, like one I showed down here. And then we present these outputs to the investigators that now know what to look for in that claim to make a decision. So that is all for me. I hope you find it useful and thank you for your attention. <laughs>